Welcome to Lecture 22, entitled An Overview of the Divergence Theorem, Stokes Theorem, and the Fundamental Theorem of Line Integrals. So this basically lecture introduces these three major theorems, uh, which more or less constitute the backbone of vector calculus. Uh, this material comes from Reading Assignment 4, uh, the introduction to Section 4, Part 4. And the objectives of this lecture just are to give you an overview of the theorems used in the remainder of the reading, this reading assignment and the geometric and, math, geometric and mathematical relationships. No actual calculations, just to sort of wrap your mind around what these different types of uh, mathematical relationships actually mean. Then the main concepts and visualization skills uh, developed within this uh, lecture are the divergence theorem in 3D and the equivalent theorem in 2D, which is called Green's Flux Theorem. Stokes Theorem in 3D and its equivalent form in 2D, which we call Green Circulation Theorem in 2D. And lastly, the fundamental theorem of line integrals for irritational fields, either in 2D and 3D, source free fields in 2D, and source free fields in 3D. Note, in this course, we will not cover in any detail the fundamental theorem for integrals, due to lack of time, and you are not responsible for this material. So more or less, this is just to sort of give you a sort of a high level overview before we start to dig in into any details. One other matter of interest is that these notes basically start with 3D and basically evolve to 2D, whereas the textbook has taken the traditional view of doing everything in 2D, invoking 3D concepts in 2D, um, but not basically allowing a sort of a transparent understanding as to how you move from 2D to 3D. It's somewhat easier to go the other way around, which is effectively the route that I've taken in these notes and in the lectures. As usual, the uh, second slide is just a summary of the slides to follow. Notice I've put um, one of the items in sort of an orange color. That's only to indicate that you're not responsible for the material, nor is it in the text or in the notes in any specific manner other than buried in an appendix. But I thought I'd put it here just to sort of to, com to, uh, to complete the, uh, the, the notes. All right, so let's start with an overview of geometric conventions when applying the divergence theorem. And so there'll be a 3D version and a 2D version, the 2D version being Green's flux theorem, which we'll get into more detail a little bit later in the lecture. So for the divergence theorem, we are looking always at a closed surface. And so the picture on your right, you know, just shows basically a sphere, but it doesn't have to be. It's a continuous smooth surface, so we can identify a, a vector normal to that surface. It's a differential area vector, NDS, and that encloses a volume. So a closed surface encloses a volume. And the convention here, when you apply the divergence theorem, will be make sure that the surface area vector is pointing outwards from a surface. Right? That's the only issue that you need to worry about so that you apply the theorem correctly. In 2D, we're talking about a contour that encloses an area, closed contour. In this case, typically, we are always traversing the contour in a counterclockwise direction, which means the normal points outwards to your right. And so in this case, we're always concerned with a normal vector pointing outwards from the contour when applying the divergence theorem in 2D, which is more or less what we will call um, Green's flux theorem later. All right, so now what about the geometric conventions when applying Stokes theorem? So we're going to have a 3D version and a 2D version. And so this one is a little bit more complicated because it involves vectors all the way. And so the little picture to your right at the top shows a contour in red. And it's basically in a counterclockwise direction. And so you should be using your right hand. Okay. So the main points are as follows. The orientation vector for a differential area on an open surface, not a closed surface, bounded by a closed contour, points in a direction consistent with the right hand rule. And so the right hand rule is you let the fingers point in the direction of the contour traversal, which is counterclockwise, and the thumb points in the direction of the orientation vector. The direction for the orientation vector is consistent for all possible surfaces. So I've shown only two in the diagram on the upper right. There's the one which is sort of olive green, and you can see that labeled as NS2, DS2. 
And so that's a planar circular area. So that vector as you sweep across the surface points always in the same direction. And it's pacing basically pointing in a direction consistent with the right hand rule. Another possible surface bound by the same contour is the blue hemisphere. In this case, you have NS1, DS1 also pointing outwards, again according to the right hand convention. So just keep this in mind that the Stokes theorem's convention is not the same as the divergence theorem. Please keep them separate. All right, the thumb, the thumb would point into the 2D plane for a clockwise traversal of the contour, whereas a counterclockwise traversal would result in the thumb pointing out of the plane. So if you take the picture above, take your right hand all right, in the direction of the traversal, you'll find that the thumb points upwards, consistent with the picture. Now, let's say you were to go around the object in the opposite direction. Again, using your right hand, it means that you would have to flip your hand the other way around, in which case both vectors would be pointing downwards rather than upwards. So you can have the traversal to go in the opposite direction, but if you do so, then the signs of the orientation vectors for any of the surfaces bound by the contour should also flip polarity, which means instead of pointing upwards, they point downwards. If you want, you can look at the... Uh, um, URL there. If you want to play with the object, look at it from different perspectives. All right, what about the 2D case? Well, in the 2D case, we'd be talking about a contour, and so a tangent again, TDS. And again, using the right-hand rule, you would basically show that your thumb is pointing upwards. Well, in 2D, there is no up. We call it Z in the 3D system. And so to account for the fact that we are dealing with a 2D system, we basically assume that the z-axis direction is uh, a, a pseudo vector j. And so basically, we just uh, uh, use this to describe what's going on. And so this is the uh, uh, URL which you can look at. So next thing to do is to consider uh, the overview of the geometric conventions when applying the fundamental theorem for line integrals. As I stated at the beginning of this lecture, you're not responsible for the material, but it by putting in here, I basically at least uh, introduce you to the theorems that constitute uh, uh, vector calculus. So we're going to look at two specific cases here, uh, the source-free field for the 2D case and the irrotational field for the 2D and 3D case. All right, and so what we're trying to do here is to try to see whether or not we can relate the endpoints on a particular contour uh, to some specific scalar property. And the details will become apparent when we look at the actual mathematical relationships. So again, for the source three field, the contour is traversed between two points. And that means that the direction normal to the contour for the 2D case must be taken to the right of the direction of traversal. And so in the picture that you see on the upper right, the direction of traversal is TDS and to your right is NDS. And so you're going from the point at the top to the point at the bottom. In the irrotational field case, uh, again, in this case, the contour is traversed between two points for the 2D and 3D cases. So just keep this in mind. The mathematics basically will come shortly, but really what we're trying to do is to identify whether or not integration along a contour can be related to the properties of the endpoints in all of the cases shown on this uh, uh, slide. All right, so now let's go into more detail and look at the mathematics, more or less the form. <clears throat> and then from there, you know, in the subsequent lectures, we can actually use this information. All right, Stokes' theorem in 3D is stated uh, in the top left-hand corner. It's bolded in orange. And so the question is, what does this mean? Well, this means a closed contour integral. F is some vector field. This is a tangent vector, and you're integrating the dot truck between these two around a closed loop. This, of course, is a circulation. All right, the net result is a circulation. What we're saying is that if you do this calculation, that's equivalent to taking the curl of this vector field and dot prodding it with a surface area vector and integrating over the surface. And this surface basically is bound by this contour. And here, of course, the right-hand rule would apply. So, for instance, the direction of T and the direction of NS are linked to each other through the right-hand rule. And so if we use this picture again, here's TDS. And going the right-hand rule, 
the area vector will be pointing upwards. And again, because you have, can choose an infinite number of surfaces bound by this contour, the actual choice of surface becomes a degree of uh, freedom. And so, for instance, this is one possible surface bound by the contour, this is another. And the area vector, again, according to the right-hand rule, would be pointing outwards. All right, so more or less, this is uh, the picture, uh, and this is the description to go with it. All right, what about the divergence theorem in 3D? All right, in this case, basically, we have this relationship, which essentially says that if you take a vector field and dot product with a differential surface area and integrate the resultant scalar va value over the closed surface, this means closed surface, that's equivalent to taking the divergence of the vector field, integrating it over the volume enclosed by the closed surface, and that result should be identical to this on the left-hand side. All right, and so from a diagram point of view, since we're using the divergence theorem, the surface area vector must be pointing outwards from the surface that's bounding the interior volume. And so this is always something you should keep in mind so that you do not confuse the Stokes theorem convention with the divergence theorem convention. So that more or less gives you sort of an idea of what the, the divergence theorem is all about. All right, let's look at then what happens when we move into 2D and that would be Stokes theorem applied in a 2D setting, and we'll call that green circulation theorem. We will prove this a little bit later, uh, but for now, basically take the formulas as a given. So let's look here at the 2D equivalent form. So this would be a vector field in 2D, and so this is the way you would describe it in terms of a x component of function xy, y component of function xy, and feet t of 2d is equivalent to t. Uh, basically, we're just going to interchange these two. It's understood that the tangent vector here is going to be a 2d, uh, a 2D vector. If we were to take the dot product of the field vector in 2d and the tangent vector, which is a, the resultant is a scalar, and integrate the resultant scalar function around the closed contour, that's equivalent to taking this expression here. In other words, taking g partial x minus f partial y. This is a scalar function integrating over the area enclosed by the contour. These two are equivalent. Again, the convention is the same. Basically, you're going counterclockwise around the circle. This is called Green Circulation Theorem, or equivalently, it's Stokes Theorem in 2D. All right, so let's look at the uh, Green's theorem, uh, let's look at the divergence theorem, but in a 2D setting, in which we call it Green's flux theorem. So in this case, basically, we're dealing with the vector field in 2D. Again, it has a similar relationship as the case for uh, Green's uh, circulation theorem. But in this case, we're taking the normal to the contour. And again, the normal to contour is to your right, assuming that you're traversing the contour in a counterclockwise direction. If you take the dot product between these two, you get a scalar function. And if you integrate that scalar function around the closed loop, again, this now will become a flux. All right, this is, has the units of a flux. That's equivalent to taking this entity here, where you're taking the partial of f with respect to x, adding it to the partial of g with respect to y. This is a scalar function. And integrating by, over the area enclosed by the contour. All right. So this is more or less called Green's flux theorem. And again, in the flux theorem, uh, the arrow is pointing outwards from the contour. All right, so this is more or less the, the mathematical form of Green's flux theorem. I think if you understand these conventions and what's being done, the actual numerical calculations are things you've already done because in one case we're dealing with contour integrals and in the other case we're dealing with surface integrals. All right, so now this portion uh, of the lecture is uh, for your interest only. Uh, we're not going to be looking at detail again because we just don't have the time, but I introduce you to it anyway. It's called the Fundamental Theorem of Line Integrals. There's one for irrotational fields, and there is also one for, um, for um, source-free fields. So we'll do each one in turn. For irrotational fields, we have basically this expression. So this essentially says f, of f flux dot tds 
So this would be an irrotational field. F equals F flux would be an irrotational field. Um, and this is equivalent to integrating uh, between some point A and some point B. All right, this is basically how the theorem is set up. And if you define F flux to be the gradient of a scalar function, all right, so this is the definition, F flux is grad phi, then this integral is more or less equivalent to evaluating what this scalar function is at point B and subtracting it from the value of the scalar function at point A. So this is the fundamental theorem of line integrals for irrotational fields. And so the other thing that's interesting is that it doesn't really matter the path that you take. So this path that you take from point A to B, it could have gone this way, it could have squiggled around and come this way, but the net result is the same, that independent of the path taken, you always end up with a difference between the value of this scalar potential evaluate at point B minus the value uh, scalar potential value at point A. All right, and so these are, as we said earlier, these are conservative fields. When you have something of this nature, right, then this is a conservative field. All right, for a source tree field, I mean, you, the problem looks more or less the same, except instead of an, doing an integral with respect to a tangent vector, it's with a normal vector. So in this case, this is, uh, if it's source three, then it means that we only have a circulation field, F circle dot NDS. And again, we're gonna integrate between two points A and B. And in this case, it's uh, related to uh, another type of function, not the scalar function phi, but psi function, evaluated B minus the value of this psi evaluated A. So va value of psi evaluated here minus the value of psi evaluated here. Now this psi, which is different than what we saw earlier, is a function of x and y because it's a two-dimensional problem. We call this a stream function to distinguish it from a scalar potential function. So this is a scalar stream function. And if you set things up in such a way that you take the derivative of the stream function with respect to y and that becomes your x component, and then take the derivative, of this, uh, partial derivative of the stream function with respect to x, my, make it negative, and make this the y component, and then state that this is equal to f circulation, then effectively this is expression is, is true. Okay, so this is just a note that a 2D stream function is a scalar function from which the circulation field is constructed. The components of this field are such that if you take the divergence of the circulation field equals zero. Now you can prove that for yourself because the divergence would be taking this derived with respect to x, and then adding it to the derivative of this respect to y. But these functions are, are considered continuous, and so whether you do dy dx or dx dy, essentially you're dealing with the same um, outcome. The only difference is when you add them, you're actually subtracting them, which means the net result is zero, so that's consistent with this expression. So we know that this is the correct expression to work with. Again, the path, the result is path independent. In other words, if I go this route or this route, this result doesn't change. It's still going to be the difference between the value of the stream function evaluated at B minus the value of the stream function evaluated at A. All right, so this is another one now which deals with source tree in 3D where we're dealing with surfaces. And so here what I've done is written it out. It's not in the notes. It's sort of buried in one of the appendices. But all I'm doing now is I'm using the same formalism instead of using a contour now we're using a surface. And so what I'm basically saying, if I take an open surface, f circ dot n to ds, then because we know that this is going to be a source free field, that means I can write this out field in terms of a curl of a, va a va vector potential a. And then I can use Stokes theorem to relate this expression to this expression. So if I take an open surface, the curl of a vector field dot NDS, that's equivalent to taking a closed loop contour A dot TS. And so this is more or less the picture. This again, the Stokes theorem picture. And again, it doesn't really matter whether or not you deal with this surface, which is bounded by the contour or this surface. Effectively, it's independent of the surface as long as basically this contour is bounding that surface. Okay, so just to 
this is just a summary. The other thing I just want to make note of here is that this vector potential A, which up to now basically is just some entity which you haven't even seen before, will be investigated in more detail in the EC221, the electromagnetics course, next semester. Okay, so the last thing I want to do is to summarize some of the key definitions. All right, so let's go through these in turn. Um, first is that a vector field is comprised of a component F flux, which is irrotational, and a component F circ, which is source three. And just again, this is just a question of convention of names. Uh, a vector field which is rotation free, also called irrotational, is also defined as a conservative field. It's just a label that's attached to an irrotational field. Secondly, a vector field which is source free is defined as a source free or solenoidal field. Again, this is basically conventional terminology has been used in the past. A source free field, that is F is equal to F circ, is defined by the vector equation F equals the curl of some vector potential A. And A, what does A look like? Well, A has an X, Y, and Z component if we're basically talking about a 3D problem. On the other hand, if we're dealing with a 2D problem, then what we do is we assign a fictitious Z component to the vector potential. And so you have 0, 0, A of Z. But the vector potential A of Z component can only be function of X and Y since we basically get defined as, as being a 2D problem. All right, so we've done this again because if we're going to take the curl of a vector field, we need to have a three-dimensional vector field. Okay, so third bullet point is if an irrotational field, that is F is equal to F flux, is defined by the vector equation gradient of scalar potential phi. So scalar potential phi in 3D will have three components, and scalar potential in 2D will have two components. And so the last thing to do is to summarize all the different cases that we considered. If we have a conservative field, right, a conservative field is irrotational, either for the 2D and 3D case, then we have these two expressions. We essentially say if we integrate f dot t s d s between a point A and B, which is like a partial circulation, and then go back, go from B back to A, which means we formed a closed loop, then the result of this calculation is going to be equal to zero. In a more succinct fashion, it means if I take any closed loop, uh, which means I'm taking circulation, is equal to zero if I'm dealing with a conservative field or an irrotational field. If it's a source fee field in 2D, then effectively, I'm, instead of using TDS, I'm using NSDS. Again, what I'm doing is going from A to B, and then from B to A. If I do this integration around a closed loop, I end up with a value which is equal to zero. Or, effectively, because it's a clope, I can take this and simplify it and just write as a closed loop integral, f dot nsds equals zero. This is the case for a source-free field in 2D. For a source-free field in 3D, we start with the notion of a closed surface. So this means f the vector field F dot NSDS. This is the surface area vector pointing outwards from the surface. And now what we're going to do is break this up to an upper surface and a lower surface. These two surfaces are glued together, but they share a common boundary or contour um, at which point the two surfaces are stuck together. All right, so we just broke them out in this fashion. Now, because this is a uh, source-free field, then we can make use of the fact that F is the curl of the vector potential A. And so we just substitute in here the curl of A, and we substitute in here the curl of A. But by Stokes' theorem, this expression is equivalent to a closed contour integral over the vector, the tangent vector around the closed contour, which is bounding both surface S1 and surface S2. And in this case, curl of this becomes also curl of A, but the contour now has to be different because the, this surface is below the contour, whereas this surface was above the contour. And so to be consistent with Stokes' theorem, this contour, you have to go in the opposite direction. That's why there's a minus sign shown here. So that means that this term and this term are equivalent, except they're opposite in sign, which means if I add them together, I get zero. 
So the ultimate end point or end statement would be that this integral over closed surface is equal to zero. So that concludes lecture 22. Uh, thank you for listening.